we are so incredibly fortunate to have two people with us that live in Conway who were in the area when the Berlin Wall came down 30 years ago. As most of you know, um, in November we have the 30th anniversary. I think that's pretty incredible that Conway, as small as it is, has two of you that were there um, and who have first-hand experiences about the wall coming down and um, about life on the other side of the Iron Curtain that they're going to share with us tonight. And I'll give you a quick bio of each of them. Um, Dr. Judith Wormuth Atkinson. Um, Judith is our, on our Board of Trustees. That's, I think, her most important position. We're proud to have her. Um, she is uh, an author and a specialist in world literature. She has studied and taught at universities in Sofia, Munich, and the United States. She received her BA and ABD from the University of Munich and her PhD from Columbia University, where she also taught courses on literature, social and political philosophy, and aesthetics. She writes poetry and nonfiction prose in 1999 for the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. She published in Germany a socio-political memoir entitled Closer to the Distance, about growing up in a mixed family, a Bulgarian Christian mother and a German Jewish father in a communist country, and about her illegal escape through the Iron Curtain with her eight-year-old son. She's recently translated her memoir into English and has added a part two to the revised English language version, which will be published next year, in 2020. Alan Greenfield, who's also with us tonight, is a retired senior foreign service officer. Um, he was born in Ware, Massachusetts. He grew up overseas in North Africa, France, and Germany. Uh, Alan received his bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland and a master's in Russian studies from Georgetown University. He served in the Army as a Russian translator in Berlin and spent most of his 26-year career as a diplomat overseas. While in the Foreign Service, he served, among other places, in West Berlin, Moscow, and as part of the team that opened our first embassy in Tbilisi, Georgia. In Frankfurt, Germany, in Washington, he was responsible for supporting management operations at all the new embassies in the former Soviet Union, traveling to new republics from 1996 to 1998, and in retirement, Alan continues to take short overseas assignments for the Foreign Service in the Middle East and in the former Soviet Union. Um, I ask that you save questions for them when they're both done speaking at the end. And I think there'll be time to ask questions, to talk with them, to share in some refreshments and um, food that we brought. So without further ado, uh, we're going to start with Judith. Thank you, Peter. So here's Judith. Thanks so much. Thank you all for coming on a very nasty, rainy winter night to listen to a talk on a topic that is frequently related to the past, to history. It is this very notion of the past and of history that I want to say something about tonight, the past of authoritarian regimes in communist countries. In 1988, the big reformer, Mikhail Gorbachev, announced in a speech to the United Nations that, quote unquote, the Soviet Union would no longer intervene in the affairs of its Eastern European satellite states. In the context of the reform movements of the 1980s, Glasnost and Perestroika, Gorbachev's statement was perceived as a declaration of the end of the Cold War. <clears throat> In the summer of 1989, an American political scientist and expert on Soviet foreign policy by the name Francis Fukuyama published an article that later became a very famous book called The End of History. Fukuyama insisted that after fascism was killed off in World War II, now communism is imploding and this uh, meant the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union, which was the last alternative to liberalism. And with that 
fact, liber the, this alternative to liberalism was eliminated. Western economics and the lifestyle associated with it, according to him, were the final destination of mankind's evolution, social and political. And even in states like China, he said, the economic reforms would lead to a new liberal order. On November 9th, 1989, a few months after Fukuyama published that article, the Berlin Wall, erected in 1961, but I will let Ellen talk about this, the concrete barbed wire wall that divided the capital of Germany, the country, Europe, and symbolically the world into two main antagonistic <coughs> political orders, communism and capitalism, was stormed by the crowds and destroyed. I will pass around, since our technology didn't work out, I can pass around two images of the first moments of breaking the wall. This was probably the most significant political event in the second part of the 20th century. As the Berlin Wall came down, the entire Soviet power structure with its close borders, economic oppression and mind controls started to disintegrate, both in the Soviet Union and in the so-called Eastern or Socialist Bloc. In, December, in November and December the same year, we had the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. This was the non-violent transition from a one-party system to a government of parliamentary republic. And then, after more than 40 years, in 1990, East Germany ceased to exist, and the country was reunified. At the end of 1991, Gorbachev resigned, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics dissolved. The two former Cold War adversaries, the US and Russia, lifted all restrictions on movement and numbers of diplomatic and official personnel, and agreed to continue the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty negotiations, which have started, had started before the fall of the war. One by one, the borders of other East European countries were opened. People were able to travel, to exchange experience and knowledge. And previously, centrally planned economies across Eastern Europe, the former Soviet republics, and Central Asia that had ruined those countries were given a chance to come back to life and to develop. The ideas of free market economy and privatization were quickly adopted. Elections were free, which means that people no longer had one single ballot with one single name that they were supposed mandatory to go and cast. <laughs> Free periodical publications were popping up one after the other, and generally, the events were seen as the victory for liberal democracy. The wall, where hundreds of people were killed when trying to escape, no longer existed. And people were trying to escape in all imaginable ways, through sewage canals, through, by swimming through the river. I am showing you two images of the two most famous escapes of the Berlin Wall. One was with an air balloon, which was lifted above the level of the raiders. And the other one was using a pulley and the rope for the pulley was attached to a building on the western, uh, sorry, on the eastern side, 
of Germany, of Berlin, and the other side was attached to a car. A friend was waiting um, yeah. in, East, in, in West Berlin. They were both successful. Unfortunately, not everything was successful. And to mention what it, I mean but not everything is successful, uh, I want to tell you that out of an estimated number I read of 5,000 escapes, a total of 239 people, 239 people died while trying to cross the Berlin Wall. Meanwhile, however, 415 East Germans, Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, Chechens, and other Soviet citizens were killed by trying to escape to the west through the Bulgarian border to Turkey, which seemed to be very easy. Unfortunately, it was very well guarded. It was electrified, also barbed wire, um, and many people lost their lives there. At the event marking the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall this year, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel made a beautiful statement, quote unquote, no wall that keeps people out and restricts freedom is so high that it cannot be broken down, she said. But in this very speech, she also warned that the values on which Europe and any other liberal <coughs> society is founded, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, human rights, they are anything but self-evident and they have to be revitalized and, defined and, and defended time and time again. In Eastern Europe, a whole generation has fully grown without having lived behind the Iron Curtain. Being free to travel, to join the work, working community in different countries. But what does the world look like in December 2019? What would the world look like? if Putin manages to restore old or create new authoritarian structures? What will happen if he continues to invade territories in Europe? If he continues to back authoritarian and corrupt regimes in the Middle East? What would life look like if Viktor Orban of Hungary has it his way? If the FDA, the new German right-wing party, is successful, and by the way, the F, sorry, AFD, I mean, the correction, AFD, Alternative für Deutschland. The AFD is much stronger in Eastern Germany today than in Western Germany, because Eastern Germany considered itself <coughs> a descendant of a communist ideology. They thought that they don't have to deal with the past of fascism and Nazism. What is the life of Belarusians under Lukashenko, a president elected in 1994? Still a president. And what would the future of Hong Kong look like if the Chinese managed to crash the freedom movement and eliminate the rule of one country two systems. And how impervious is the post-communist society, or are the post-communist societies, and how impervious is the free, liberal, democratic Western world to the undermining effects of previous and of existing authoritarian structures. Alan will talk more about Russia, but I want to point out something very particular about Putin. At the time the Berlin Wall fell, Putin was a low rank KGB spy <coughs> in Eastern Germany, in Dresden. He felt humiliated. 
he panicked and there was no help from Moscow. In his <coughs> narrow-minded worldview of a KGB spy, he watched everything in his world collapse. And that image was never erased from his head. Putin's Russia did not forgive the Western world the disintegration of the Soviet Union. He has publicly said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe in the 20th century, not World War II. Russia puts a lot of effort into undermining the liberal world order, into backing corrupt regimes, into supporting separatist movement like the Catalonia movement, into supporting far-right parties like the French um, Front National, the National Front. We all know painfully well, and I'm not going to say a word about this, but we know that Russia has interfered with elections, and I'm talking about other elections, about the elections in Ukraine, about the elections <coughs> in Poland, about the elections in Bulgaria, most of all about the elections in Montenegro, when in 2016 Putin organized a coup and an assassination attempt aimed at the president Milo Dukanovic because the president wanted Montenegro to join NATO. Bulgaria was a NATO member, uh, Romania was a NATO member, and Putin's Balkan strategy was going down the drain, so he decided that Dukanovic has to die. We also probably remember that last year, the FBI arrested this pretty Russian woman, Maria uh, Butina, who tried to infiltrate the NRA and other influential uh, institutions. And he organized a Russian-based um, campaign that tried to influence by social media the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. For what purpose? Scientists believe that the purpose is fueling fear on both sides, on the right and on the left, and amplifying the hate on both sides. And the point here is not that there shouldn't be right views in the world. The point is that when you instigate hate on both sides, most particularly when you instigate fear on both sides, both sides become more <coughs> extreme and both sides become more intolerant. Fukuyama was talking about the liberal order that China is heading to. Well, China did introduce major economic reforms, yet as a country based on a firm communist ideology, it still pursues the goal of molding human minds. They sent people to places they call centers for re-education, which are actually concentration camps, to treat them for what they define a disease of, in, to treat them for a disease that they define as infection of the mind. And they try to tell the world that they are fighting terrorism and radicalization. But in fact, this has nothing to do with terrorism and radicalization because it is a very old requirement, goal in the Marxist-Leninist philosophy of the state. It is the, the, the goal of establishing, building, they call it, a culturally monolith atheist nation. We had the same, absolutely the same issue in Bulgaria when, uh, in the 80s, when um, Muslim population of Turkish and not <coughs> Turkish descent was terrorized in all possible ways after they had lived for centuries together with 
the Bulgarians and the Christians and everybody else. They had to change their names. Birth records were destroyed, burned. People were deprived of salaries, of pensions, unless they changed their names. The Turkish language radio station was um, closed, and Muslims were not allowed to speak Turkish in public, or, of course, to wear their traditional clothes, the shalvari, the, the back pants, and not to speak about the farage and the veil. Eventually, this resulted in the exodus of about 330,000 Muslim citizens who were extradited from Bulgaria in May, June 1988, just before the wall fell. But the process continued after the fall as well. And uh, yeah, these are uh, small photographs of the labor camps in China and some labor camps in Bulgaria. And there is one more batch of those. And lastly, how do the lessons of the communist past relate to the current global refugee crisis and the question of migration? What forces people to leave behind their homes and livelihoods? What are their motivations and drives to escape their countries, to emigrate, to risk their lives and the lives of their children, and to accept the uncertain future of a refugee? What is home for them? Do people like that bring any merit to the societies they join? The refugee crisis has become a great challenge for leaders in Europe and in this country. But in the last few years, we have seen that migrants have been vilified both in Europe and in the US. It is an ancient method. The Greeks have used it, the Romans have used it, the Portuguese and the Spanish have used it, the Chinese and the Soviets have used it. When a regime wants to deprive whole groups of people of their rights, those groups have to be marginalized. And when they have to be marginalized, they have to be described as savages, mentally ill, drug dealers, prostitutes, thieves, rapists, etc., etc., etc. Statistically, it takes many generations for marginalized people to recover and to reestablish themselves. Fukuyama was dead wrong that 1988 was the end of history. History obviously doesn't end. History is always in the making. It seems actually to be related to the future as much as it is to the past, because the future is the consequences of the thoughts, of our thoughts and deeds at the time we live. The Berlin Wall is fallen, but it keeps being rebuilt in different ways and in different places. I did know firsthand a communist regime. <coughs> the manipulation machine was trapping people since very, from a very early age through the membership in organizations. They started with kids aged 7 to 9, then 9 to 14, and then the famous Komsomol organization for people, after, you know, <clears throat> teenagers older than 14 years. Uh, what was just one single example, there was a price called the sharp eye for children who would denounce their classmates, their friends, their neighbors, maybe their parents, 
maybe the neighbors of the neighbors, and so on. So if a child gave the state some critical information, that child would be rewarded for, them, for it. Um, I experienced the interrogations of the state security. Uh, some of the interrogations in my later years in Bulgaria were more serious. Some, when I was very young, <coughs> were so smallish and petty and stupid and everything was blown out of proportion. But <laughs> it may be interesting to know that the first time I was interrogated when I was 12 years old. And when I was 12 years old, I was interrogated because somebody published a small poem of mine, which was um, about friendships that were falling apart. And during this conversation, this was not a Guantanamo Bay style of interrogation, <laughs> but in our conversation, or in their conversation, uh, they showed me, I think I gave you this picture already. There is a picture of uh, uh, a very happy woman with some flowers and so on. And they asked me, aren't you inspired by the building of the future communist society? You know, Why do you write about garbage like this, friends? Ever since I was labeled apolitical. So I will say political. Um, I have experienced the, or witnessed rather, the trials related to the dissemination of books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I have experienced personally the house rates for incriminated literature. And if you hear incriminated literature, you will think God knows what literature. Some philosophy was incriminated, literature, Hegel, Kant, Nietzsche, uh, God forbid. Uh, the Bible was forbidden literature. So there were books walking around like ghosts in the streets of, of Sofia because we were moving them from one friend to another, from the basement to the attic, out of the city, back to the city. I had friends whose families were interned, which means sent to an internal exile to remote <coughs> parts of the country with no access to family, friends, medical help, money, whatsoever. I had a friend who was a journalist and was sent to a psychiatric hospital because he published an article in which there were two critical sentences. And I've definitely experience the persecutions of an ethical, spiritual movement which uh, was labeled as, you know, the members were labeled as uh, enemies of the state for the only reason that uh, this movement had followers all over the world. There is a community in California, in New York, here, there, uh, Switzerland, etc. And I have also seen the corruption not only of officials, that was clear, but the corruption of dissident thinkers, writers, poets, artists, because the Bulgarian communist regime came up with a fantastic idea to use humans' natural instinct to want to prosper, to want to develop, to want to succeed. So they would give them a little bit something here and there, and people would become corrupt. I and mean, not everybody, many did. Eventually, things became intolerable, and I escaped. I escaped illegal, illegally through a few borders with my eight-year-old son. I became a refugee and then a migrant, not in one, but in four countries. So when I discuss social and political phenomena, I do this from a few different perspectives. 
From the perspective of a young Bulgarian-born woman, outcast from society partly because of her dissident political views, partly because of her spiritual views, and partly because of her German-Jewish heritage. If anybody thinks there was no anti-Semitism under communism, this is fiction. From the perspective of a Jewish woman ostracized from a conservative, I would say, Israeli society because of her mother's Christian religion. From the perspective of a young German woman wishing to be welcomed in her father's home country by a society that at the time was falling back deeply into xenophobia just as it was reunifying. It was also the time of the last Balkan War and they were overwhelmed with, with refugees from Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Macedonia, and so on. And then, of course, from the perspective of someone who has lived for more than a quarter of a century in this country. So to conclude, from my multiple perspectives, so to speak, I see something that stands out in my eyes as a very big threat to society and to human nature as such. Authoritarianism does not tolerate dissent. It needs uniformity. But this works the other way around as well. Uniformity could easily lead to authoritarianism. To resist it, it is imperative that a liberal society and individuals in it develop and protect free, independent thinking. Thinking, of course, can be also easily corrupted by ignorance, by propaganda, by information, misinformation, fake news, etc., etc. So we do know that it is important to always look for alternative sources of information. We do know that it is important to protect the institutions that train us in free, independent thinking. In the first place, the educational institutions and the press. But how do we know that our thinking is free and independent? I was extremely fortunate to be teaching for many years a course. It was a philosophy course, but the goal of this course was to develop in the students free, independent <coughs> thinking. And my classes were amazingly diverse. I had Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus, Confucianists from South Korea, all races, all kinds of people. And from my students, I learned that if we want to develop free independent thinking, we need to leave the comfort zone of like-mindedness. And we need to put serious, conscious effort into learning about studying and understanding the other. Other people, other parties, other political views, <coughs> other cultures, other religions, and other countries. So, to me, I cannot go back because I don't have the screen now, but I wanted to say, what was on the other side of the wall? It was one thing for me. It was another thing for Ellen. It was yet another thing for you. But the question that determines whether we are free and independent in our thinking is how much we know about the other side of any wall. <coughs> And now I will let...
Good evening. That's really hard to follow. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Judith is the one who came up with the title for the presentation tonight, The Other Side of the Wall. And I thought it was brilliant because we both started on opposite sides of the wall and we both moved to the other side of the wall. <laughs> the only difference is I had a diplomatic passport and I could go back. <clears throat> um, putting this together, I all of a sudden realized that my life was pretty, especially when I was younger, pretty well tied to uh, events in, in Germany and um, since I was living there, but also to Berlin and the wall. In the summer of 61, I was a junior in high school in Frankfurt, Germany, and the, um, <clears throat> at that time there wasn't the uh, American television yet, but I was listening to the Armed Forces uh, radio uh, on an hourly basis, and they were reporting uh, constantly on the construction of the wall. All of a sudden it, it went up, it went up overnight, and <clears throat> every day we heard stories of people jumping the wall. We heard stories of the Vopos, the, the you know, German Volkspolizei, who were supposed to be guarding the construction of the wall, who ran to West Berlin. Uh, people jumping from the windows of the buildings who were right on the wall. Just, I mean, they would jump from the third and fourth story just to try to get out. I mean, their, their efforts to, 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 to leave uh, were, <clears throat> were superhuman. Um, the, and Judy's give you some of the numbers, but from 1947 to the time the wall went up, uh, one sixth of the population of East Germany left and went to the West, and that's how that's what the conditions were like over there. Uh, Russia had taken total control; they were, you know, to use <clears throat> a fairly strong word, they were raping the country. They took the, the steel rails from the sub from the uh, the trolley cars and for the rail yards, they took all the machinery. They they left they left a ruin, and <clears throat> they they re, the Germans. Uh, I mean, it's a real testament to the, the spirit of the Germans, whether they're east or west, that they were able able to rebuild that. Five years later, <clears throat> from sixty one to sixty six. In sixty six, I was in West in West Berlin, as a Russian translator, uh, intercepting. Uh, radio transmissions uh, of the uh, Soviet forces in East Germany. And <clears throat> while, while it was there, uh, it was all fairly routine stuff, just movement of tanks through the woods and stuff like this. But in the summer of 68, I was there when, um, when the Russians moved into Prague. Mm -hmm. And we followed, we, fought, we were able to follow that very, and, and it was a brutal takeover. <clears throat> and. Uh, but um, it was, it was a, a real eye-opening experience for me. Uh, <clears throat> for us, life was really good in, in the West, but we always had to be on our toes because <laughs> I'm sure uh, most of you have seen movies or read spy stories of what Berlin was like. I mean, it's a real, it's a real passion of mine anyway, but it really was a city of spies. People, uh, you, you never know who was who. Was who. There and uh, while I was in um, while I was in Berlin, posted in the Foreign Service in 1987, um, one of our most trusted um, uh, local employees, one of our German employees in the U.S. mission, turned out to be a Stasi spy and had been for years. So I mean, you really you really didn't know uh, who was who, but uh, you know the Berlin experience, uh, you know, from both the army. And in uh, in the foreign service was very interesting. While we were, while I was in the foreign service, it was a lot easier for us uh, than it had been for me in the army. Because while I was in the army, because of my security clearance, I wasn't allowed to go to uh, East Berlin, even though I had the same clearance in the foreign service I was. And uh, we went over there, and um, uh, we went. We were able to go out to dinner there, go out, go shopping. Uh, we weren't able to go very far. In, in you know only to the to the city limits, but uh, it was it was interesting. What was really fascinating, we we arrived the year after Berlin had celebrated I think its 700th anniversary, and they had beautified the city, a lot of new construction, 
and <clears throat> a lot of celebrations and fireworks. Not to be outdone, the East Berliners, right along the wall, spruced up their city. So there were some, so there were some nice <coughs> restaurants there that we went to, but you went just, it was really a Potemkin village because you just went one, one block further and it was still uh, rubble. It was still bombed out buildings, Soviet buildings. Uh, <clears throat> so it was really just uh, uh, eye, eye candy to, to show the West that they couldn't get yeah, uh, done. In 1989, from, um, <clears throat> from Berlin, we moved to Moscow. And um, our main job at the, at the embassy there for that, for that first year from uh, late 89 to uh, September of 90 was supporting the four plus two talks uh, th uh, for the uh, reunification of Germany. And it was quite an event when the, wall, <clears throat> when the two countries were um, re reunited. And immediately life in Moscow changed, uh, you know, as Judith said, Gorbachev had, uh, announced basically the end of the Soviet Union, and it was really palpable in in Moscow. The the, the currency started floating. Uh, we could move around a lot more freely uh, for for Westerners and for the uh, what's known as the nomenklatura, the the uh, bigwigs in the uh, uh, Soviet government. Uh, life became really really sweet because. The, the ministers of the uh, various uh, industry, of the various uh, departments, were able to go out and privatize the uh, natural resources, the oil refineries, the oil fields, uh, the steel mills, the aluminum mills. And <clears throat> capitalism was the Wild West all of a sudden. You know, they, anything they could steal, they could get their hands on. And for them, you know, <clears throat> they, they, brought, they bought in their Mercedes, their Rolls Royces, things like that. <clears throat> but for the men on the street, things weren't so good. We met, uh, we met widows and retirees who were still trying to get by on 100 rubles a month pension. And to a person, they all wanted to go back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it wasn't a lot of fun. I had one contact who, um, in order to get through the, uh, get through the cold winter, had stashed 1,500 kilos of potatoes and onions in his apartment. <clears throat> so, <laughs> but, but we had a lot of fun. We, uh, we uh, got to go to the Bol Bolshoi uh, Ballet uh, very inexpensively. Uh, my youngest son and I uh, were invited with a group of kids to go to, um, to Baikonur, the uh, Russian uh, Cape Canaveral, watch a space launch there, and then uh, and my, my wife received a, a call in her office inviting her, uh, her to put together a group to visit the uh, KGB museum for the first time. <laughs> and <laughs> it was no surprise that the biggest room in the museum was devoted to the fight against the, number, the primary enemy, which was us. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was, that, was that was good. Um, in um, February of 1991, our, uh, our youngest son and I hopped on a train in Moscow to go to uh, Berlin for the first time. Uh, and we ended up in the, uh, in the Ostbahnhof, the, uh, uh, the train station in, East, in former East Berlin. And <clears throat> the next morning, we walked down the main street of uh, East Berlin, wintered in Linden, through the Brandenburg Gate uh, up to the Victory Column on the, on the western side. And to me, that was a huge thrill because after watching the wall go up and seeing the wall when I was there in the army, to be able to walk through the Brandenburg Gate again was uh, a real, a real thrill. Um, <clears throat> in um, in 1992, uh, after a, a brief posting somewhere else. Phyllis and I were uh, part of the small team that went to Tbilisi, Georgia, to open the embassy there, and that was a that was a lot of uh, a lot of fun. It was a hard it was a hard post because the Russians had really put the uh, clamps on the borders, uh, so there was no heat, no water, no electricity. 
Uh, <clears throat> so it, we had to find ways to provide that. But what we did find was that the, uh, the Georgian people were very warm and outgoing and friendly. And probably uh, one of the, the country was one of the very few, other than say the Baltics, that where there was a real interest in establishing a free and open democracy. And uh, that, I mean, today they're, they're pretty, ro the democracy there is pretty robust, um, thanks partly to Phyllis's effort in identifying young up and comers at the time who uh, she sent to the states for training that would help them become better leaders for a democratic country. But we, um, <clears throat> We became very close friends with some of our Georgian employees, and uh, there were some, some interesting uh, things that happened. Um, we, hired, we hired computer people uh, who <clears throat> had never had anything more than a Commodore 64 to work with, but they were so good. Their, their education system was really good at theory, and they were able to understand and master a lot of computer uh, knowledge without the hardware. So when, they, when we gave them up-to-date computers, they just ran crazy with them. I mean, you see what the results are today. <laughs> um, another interesting one was we hired a, um, a local employee to be our economic specialist in the embassy. And she had been she received a PhD in economics from the University of Tbilisi. And uh, after she'd been there a while, she asked us to order some uh, Western economic textbooks so she could uh, get a, a better perspective than the other side. And when she got her first book, <clears throat> she was reading and she came to me and she said, uh, uh, Mr. Greenfield, what is this word profit? <laughs> <laughs> so I explained to her, <clears throat> I'm not an economist, but I think I could handle what profit was. And I explained to her, and she says, ah, yes, they used to throw us in jail, jail for that. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, we had, we had a great, we had a, a fantastic career in, in the Foreign Service. And uh, the, the amount of history we witnessed over uh, our 26 year period uh, was just uh, Hard, hard to comprehend when you look back on it. And I would say of my 26 years, I spent a third of it either in uh, Russia or the, uh, its former republics. And when I was not there, I was supporting those posts, those uh, embassies. And w what I learned <clears throat> was that, um, especially in what we refer to as the stands, the uh, you know. Uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and so on. Out there, they're still they're still struggling to get rid of the old ways. The, the governments are still we, well. Let, we can call them one-party democracies. <laughs> and, um, but um, there were there were some great successes. But from what Judah said and what I saw, uh, Russia hasn't changed much. Um, my favorite professor at Georgetown uh, <clears throat> used to chide us Americans. He says, uh, he was German. He says, you know, you Americans are so <clears throat> optimistic. Any sign, any time you see a little glimmer of hope in, in Russia, you think, ah, oh, it's all going to change overnight. He says, what you don't understand or we don't remember is that they've been uh, despotic, totalitarian regimes for 700 years. And they're not going to become liberal democracies in our lifetime. And since then, we've seen, especially, I mean, especially in Russia, that things really haven't changed. And <clears throat> um, of all the posts we served in, and the ones I still continue to go to, the one post I won't go back to is Moscow. I mean, I find the Russians really scary, and I, <laughs> I don't want anything to do with them anymore. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's my experience. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for...